Hello and welcome to a very special episode from the Institute for Natural Philosophy. Tonight we have with us the wandering wolf, Mike, that has done many trips, his shares, he has a great channel, and uh, we couldn't be more proud to have it with us for the first episode ever in the Institute for Natural Philosophy with special guests. So I would also introduce Guilherme Reis and the Ancient Alternative View, AAV or Phil, that will with us present this episode. So good evening to you all. Good evening, Mike. How are you? Everything good. okay? So good to be with you guys. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, it's an honor. It's an honor for us. Phil Gee. Mike, you've worked with me for quite a long time and it's an absolute honor to have you with me in the Institute for Natural Philosophy. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that you've had fantastic travels in Peru and now in Malta and how are things been going where you are on your travels up to date now in Malta and what have you been up to there could you give us a quick debrief on the cart ruts and the situation that you found yourself in there and how are you sir pleasure to have you thank you so much guys for having me on yeah absolutely happy to uh share what's been going on here in Malta um yeah i've been really i mean there's it's it's hard not to get into it, stuff here in malta i mean everywhere you go is an ancient site but i've been really interested in the uh the uh cart ruts because i've been filming several locations around the world lately and there are so many examples here i just spent all day today driving all over the island and filming different places getting the drone up doing some lidar and so um, and visiting uh, awesome sites during the past week that I've been here. Malta is incredible. Um, and I'm going to have to come back because this was kind of an add-on at the last minute to my trip to the Canary Islands. And I'm really glad that I did come here to uh, Malta because it's been wonderful. But um, yeah, the cart ruts have really been what's caught my attention. There are so many different types, varying shapes, sizes, depths um a lot of interesting stuff with the cart ruts here in malta for sure going off One into question. ocean off of cliffs on hillsides on flat land one question that i would like to ask you with yeah. obviously the cart ruts are a global ancient hallmark you know that mm -hmm. and you i've always thought of sort of uh, the juggernaut cars in india were these wheels that were going through a different kind of mineralogy or was this more of a kind of a stonework technique almost like a quarrying technique i think when we've spoken about this before you've come up with some brilliant um findings here some that i'm really intrigued that everybody out there would love to hear about and uh, what what would you say about the vitrica vitrification would would this be wheels or would this be a different aspect of technological aspects of you know the ancient world what's your thought on that mike you know what i've first of all the the cart ruts inside the the grooves are smooth you have varying shapes distances sizes you have some areas where um here in malta where the cart ruts continue on over areas that rise up in the center where there's no way anything can go over that um you know and I, I documented some of that today and um i'm trying to remember the site name um i think um it was Berg, Berg, i'd have to look it up it started with a b but um there were areas there where in between the cart rut path on some of the paths the the stone was so high it, it would it wouldn't have been any kind of let, let's just first of all let's just throw out the cart rut thing these weren't carts they weren't wagon wheeled thing you know <laughs> things traveling down here forming these paths and right. stuff, regardless if it's limestone or something else um I, I don't think that that holds water at all no cart could have gone over some of the path of the cart ruts that i saw today the inside the grooves you have varying depths you have varying um distances um between some of the cart ruts inside the grooves they're smooth um 
the only area where I saw some differentiation is in between the cart ruts. There are areas here in Malta where I've seen these shallow rectangular holes spaced out going down along the, the, the section of stone in between the cart ruts, which I haven't seen anywhere else. And what I've also noticed here and has started to kind of make sense to me is, is that it looks like a lot of these areas have evidence of stone being quarried because I'm finding cut out sections in these cart rut locations where it's clear that blocks were removed. They were cut into rectangular shapes, cut out and removed. And even today at so Salimi, I believe, cart ruts, there was um, evidence of these these kind of like the machining tool marks, you know, where you have these like angled chiseled marks within a squared out section where clearly stone had been removed. And um, I've seen that at, at several other sites here in Malta. So I'm almost curious, it kind of got my brain going and looking back at some of these other cart ride places that I visited, even over in America in Austin, uh, my hometown, you know, all of these are in areas where it's very possible that these were some kind of quarry area and the cart ruts perhaps facilitated the movement of that quarried stone. And, um, you know, I haven't heard that talked about anywhere else. We focus so much on the cart ruts, but what if the cart ruts were just, you know, a means of transport for the core, these quarry sites? And, and and so if you're finding cart ruts, what if you're also finding these ancient cart these ancient quarry sites? A lot of these areas where, where it's limestone and stuff, it's so weathered down because the site's so old, you know, the cart ruts kind of start and stop. But I'm really excited because you guys you guys are catching me right in the middle of filming all of this, which is great, but I'm I'm really looking forward to going back over all the footage, especially the drone footage where I have these really great perspectives from high above to kind of look at the lay of the land. And so it'll be exciting to share that and look over all that and kind of break. I think that would further. probably be um, a really important aspect to share is an aerial view of exactly mm -hmm. where they start from where they finish you know a topography of the whole area would yeah. be absolutely fascinating wouldn't it and if we could do that we could probably see exactly what the site looked like itself well a lot of these places they're you know? like like the site that i visited today that was and it's going to bug me now it's Ber bergami bergama Ber 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 <laughs> bergamo yeah Ber I think it's bergamo okay so that site in particular is right by they're they're quarrying stone out of an entire there's they're still quarrying stone over there you know so it's um you know it just some of it just makes sense and um I've started... I, would, I would i would ask you for instance it's some try to explain the cart roots as they are uh, some sort of uh, volcanic event or crack or something related to geology natural movements and so on but I would ask you, aren't that interruptions that you are seeing in the cart ruts the proof that they precede that geological movement or that volcanology event? I think we can eliminate um, geology forming cart ruts as quickly as sure, we can. Sure, that's not my point. I, I yeah. agree with that. I'm just saying, could that be the proof that the cart ruts are already there when the volcanology event happened and covered and crossed the cart ruts because what the point is they say the cart ruts are vo volcanology or geology because they studied those interruptions and they are masses of lava that cross that place yeah absolutely see my I point think pre, i think the cart ruts predate a lot of these geological events i mean canary islands is a spot i just visited and you can see where the lava flows have gone over the cart over ruts. exactly exactly so these were there before that they didn't just come in and carve out this one little spot for the cart ruts sure. now, i mean if you if you're looking globally at these cart ruts and and the, the connectivity between these sites all around the world 
you know, it, it, it gives us a lot of great information to work with, especially when you're able to compare it to geological events like volcano and lava flows and stuff sure. like that, if you can date those those eruptions and the, and the lava flow and things like that. So Canary Islands would be a great example of that, which I documented, LIDAR, and, and, and yeah. I didn't get to, the wind is too high out there and it's right by the airport, so I couldn't put the drone up, but, um, but got a lot of great information and you can see where the lava flows came in and covered over parts of the area where the cart rut is in, in the Canary Islands. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But on my, my, last, my last question on this would be, could they be, uh, if you find them always not in a groove, because I know that some cart routes are already in a, in a groove, in a, in a some sort of, of a narrow pathway between rock, with, uh, walls of rock with the cart routes in the middle, but most of them are on top of surfaces. They are not on valleys, they are on top of rock surfaces. So uh, that's the, at least those that, I, that I've seen. So my question would be, could they, and since they go into the sea, they, those that are near the, the water, they go, for instance, in the Azores, you also mentioned uh, previously on your posts that they actually go into the sea. The fact is, could that support your idea that could be some form of quarrying and it was being transported to the sea, to the boats? I think that that is a absolute possibility. And I think that, you know, that that is the the current theory that I am kind of working with here, boots on the ground, filming, and what I'm seeing and what is striking me in the moment is that there's a connection here between court the quarrying stone, the cart ruts, and perhaps moving moving the quarried stone somehow. Now, um, the other idea is, is that that I had today while I was on site, specifically at the one that I keep messing up, Bergomi, Bergomi, is some of those ruts are so deep, and there's areas where it looks like stone was quarried. Is that I'm almost wondering is if there was a system in place where workers would carve these cart ruts carve these ruts yeah and then the space between the ruts they would remove the stone and blocks and keep working down i see your point but do you find the evidence in your in your searches and your and your explorations that there was more stone on top of the cart ruts have you find that so i'm I am excited to share some of that footage. There's footage of like definitive cut out blocked stones at these sites and sure. right on and next to, I mean, and when I say next to, I mean directly next to the ruts, immediately next to it. And huge cut out sections where stone was removed and you can see where the stone was worked. So you know this is a working theory um you know that is a few days old for me within this week after visiting so many different examples here in malta i don't think that um, if, if i had not come to malta i don't know that i would have been able to see and then compare it to other things like in austin or in the canary islands and um but malta has so many examples of cart ruts that you're seeing all I'm, I'm, I'm kind of able to get this bigger picture and piece some things together in my head you know whether that proves to be factual or not you know i can't wait to dig into the footage a bit more especially from the aerial perspective to get a better idea of of kind of what i'm i'm proposing here and thinking of sure, but sure. it seems very much like there is a connection here to quarried stone and the cart ruts yeah, and do you think that the smoothness comes from the um, the wear and tear or the smoothness was per, uh, per, uh, per purposeful in order to allow better fluidity of whatever they use to move the slabs or whatever is on the ruts i think that the 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 smoothness the smoothness of the cart ruts was used to facilitate movement yeah 
but you think they are wear and tear because you've seen the different depths of cart ruts, right? There's some more shallow and others very deep. So do you think that that is, is a representation of wear and tear? Do you see more stone being quarried where they are deeper? Or do you think that the smoothness is only a matter of the weight is going to put on top? The depth, sorry, is a matter of the weight and the smoothness is a matter to allow fluidity. For instance, if you put, uh, I'm going to, wild here okay just going wild just to make my point if you put some sort of fluids running in the cart ruts like mercury for instance you have a way to electrify both points you'll be able to create some sort of medium in order for a sled to go by according to to its polarity for instance it's just 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 to not that i believe this uh, just to give you an idea what i'm talking about so do you think that the the depth and, and the smoothness is a matter of wear and tear for the more use it was, or is a matter of functionality? It's hard to say that because the, the, the extremes between certain spots, there's areas where the cart ruts are going in a, at a consistent depth for, for a, a period of, of space. And, and then, the whole middle section is gone and just one side is continuing on and then, continue. it, and then it continues on into a, a completely deeper area that no cart you know could or vehicle or something like that could go over it's it's so well it would be consistent mike wouldn't it it'd be consistent it's, it's completely if it's inconsistent it's not something that's just rolling through it is it right you know, if it changes like that then something else was happening to cause that inconsistency you know? yeah so it's 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 you know I, I i'm i'm really looking forward to some of these areas that had the most the highest levels of inconsistency i lidar with the polycam and i'm really looking forward to breaking some of that down and doing comparisons between some of the other areas that i that i that i lidar so when i whenever i'm able to get back home and put all this data together hopefully be able to present it in a way that shows breaks some of the stuff that you're asking ricardo about uh into a better way but the consistency can vary within a matter of feet um so and then it'll just drop off a a, a, a steep ledge and continue on straight so there's no you know the way that the way that these things travel over the ground doesn't lend itself in any way to any kind of vehicle or mode of transport in ter in terms of what we've been thinking of cart ruts as far as like a wagon or some kind of like transport system I almost, no, no sledge could go through there right no sledge no 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 unless you know, unless it is floating on top of it yeah because if you, you need a flat surface and then you're going over at angles that are so extreme sometimes that the front or back would be hitting on things as it's going over and then you're making curves as well so you you know it's you know it's hard to say i'm thinking more along the lines of like like some kind of rolling surface like stones being in the like round stones or something being in these cart ruts in certain spaces or things that could slide and move with it and 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 um maybe even but but you know why have the two maybe for support but then you get to areas where you know it's just it's a hard one to figure out um and it's it's a, it's a really interesting you know mystery um uh and i i feel I, you know this is something that i'm really excited about digging into because um i just so happen to live in a city that has cart ruts in it in in america in austin um which makes this really unique for me to be able to like just go out there um and, and check out the cart ruts at bull creek in austin um and, to, and to, you know which is something i kind of plan on doing and just kind of like after viewing all this and seeing all this here in malta being able to kind of just continue to work over it in my head but um yeah every time you think you're figuring out one thing with the cart ruts it kind of you know it's like something else about it as far as the 
the aspect of it being used for transport, something else kind of messes that up in terms of depth or size or distance or the way the the, the cart ruts run or how they intersect. Um, so it's a very it's very it's very interesting. Um, and I'm hoping that the the um, the footage and data that I've been collecting over the last week or two weeks between here and the Canary Islands and back home um, helps to continue to kind of shed some light on that and push us further down the down down the path, so to speak. I think your I think your aerial views of this will give quite an intriguing view that many people don't understand that where these could finish end where they started not just one photograph where you're just seeing a action of a art rut like you might get on google you know you're going to be able to see different dimensions of where they started and stopped with right right very very new to the ancient world out there so thank you to mike for doing that and another point of research mike that I'd be intrigued to talk of. I think we can advertise a couple of things here. Yeah. Being a massive tour between a good friend of um, all of ours here in Nikki Anna Jones and yourself uh, down in Peru later on this year. Uh, in uh, I would love to know when you guys visited there and we and everyone should know this. These guys had the pleasure of flying over the Nazca lines. Um, yeah, what was yeah. that experience like, Mike? And what did you guys find down in Peru? And how was your trip down there? Please tell us all how you got on in Peru. I mean, wow. Yeah, well, Peru is simply amazing. I mean, how else do you describe Peru? I feel like it's, um, you know, quite possibly one of the, you know, not quite possibly, I feel like it is probably the most important area in the world when it comes to ancient sites. Um, I think that there is more to be revealed in Peru, quite a bit more. Um, and we, you know, we're lucky enough to meet up down in Peru, Nikki and I, we've traveled before and we are, we're, we're leaving trip in October. And we'd love to have as many people join us as possible. It's gonna be a great one, hitting Machu Picchu, Saxe Wuman, Oleantambo, the Pisca ruins, all sorts of stuff are gonna be included in that trip. Um, so my time down there, that'll be, that was the second time that I've been there and um, absolutely loved it. The Nazca lines were incredible. Um, that's something that I missed my first time down in Peru. So I, I had to remedy that. And I was most excited about checking out the the band of holes, working this kind of agricultural theory around the band of holes that I've been working on, um, and um, which is also was responsible for this trip, me coming over to the Canary Islands to show similar ways that they're using um, agricultural techniques over here to kind of um, give a juxtaposition of of the two areas and timelines and stuff like that to see you know kind of chase down that connection. But Peru is fascinating. Um, I don't know if you guys have noted, uh, uh, saw recently that some of the um, scientific reports about um, um, them finding um, stuff in Easter Island that connected um, Easter Island to uh, South America to, to, to um, in some of the soil samples and stuff, I believe. And it's just, it's like, yeah, when you see the megalithic wall there in Easter Island, which most people don't know know about, Ahu uh, Vinapu, I believe. Actually, actually, actually has um, filler stones on that megalithic wall, which it does. is global hormone. It does, yeah. And I, I've got a video out on that site, walking the site and showing the whole wall, um, uninterrupted, no talking. You can just watch that video and check out the whole wall there on Easter Island. But it's amazing and so is peru peru has basically every example that you could hope for of megalithic construction um and so there's spots in peru where you can just you can see the layers of advanced stone working with the bottom layers being the most advanced um and you can see how it kind of 
not progresses, but gets worse in, t- in terms of its, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Built-in structure in, in how it's ornate. Place yeah, is given, and you can see where you've got like the megalithic construction, and where people say Inca built over the top of the Olente Tambo stone. You can see how the Inca tried to copy right the megalithic stone. It almost looks like children putting pebbles. With all respect to the Inca, and we're, we're talking completely different time zones in general, right. you know. And that isn't the only one, is there? Because if you look at that, you've got like say Zone X as well. Like it almost looks like it's been turned upside down. But you you've yet got these precision cut, almost sort of chicana shapes out of the stone. What on earth was going on at Zone X? Now, if you're talking about a Coricantia style stone, which we can talk about nubs and pardon me, bevel blocks and so on and so forth more intricate style stonework but what was going on with these huger stones with the same nubs was this inclusive of mineralogy did they know exactly what they were doing per size of stone were the hallmarks inclusive of knowledge to know how where and when to build different sets of stone i think in my opinion peru shows you that in its entirety more than anywhere else that would be my opinion yeah, I couldn't agree more. Peru shows all the varying types and styles of stoneworking that we see on display around the world when it comes to megalithic structures. And 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 you have a place like you mentioned, Coracancha, where the stoneworking is so absolutely precise and perfect. However, it is not the same type of stoneworking that you see just right up the hill at Saxe Waman. I mean, it is completely different. I mean, that is what you call polygonal masonry, where it's like all these different shapes and sizes fitted together to give different balance points and structural points that have resisted the test of time against earthquakes and all sorts of stuff, right? But then Coracancha has not. You can see where the wall is split from an earthquake. The wall is kind of fallen over and stuff. It doesn't have the same, you know, level of, of, of uh, strength to its structure with these smaller stones and blocks that say Saxe Wuman does. Um, And Saxe Wuman has stones there that clearly look like they were, you know, it's hard not to look at, for me anyways, it's hard for me not to look at these stones at like Saxe Wuman and not think, you know, not just get, get the feel that they were poured almost like a concrete. I mean, there's areas where it looks like the stone was, you know, worked almost like it was like had a, a you know like smoothed over and there was an ind- indentations left and I, I i show some of that um on, on some of my posts on twitter and videos um some of the specific pop sp- spots that i'm talking about but i mean it they, they really look like you know that that stone was worked now i'm not saying anything definitive along that lines but but it's it certainly looks that way and then when you get over to stuff like the stone working and, and stuff in Coracancha, those blocks were clearly cut and shaped and and you know almost you know stacked like bricks um perfectly stacked and, and fitted together um and you know don't get me wrong Coracancha has some incredible examples like drill holes and these nubs and different things like that that are 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 incredibly precise as Some well. Some of the blocks have little mini pinch holes that go right. around the blocks, you know. Exactly. Now that's very fine tooling or whatever. Are, they're very different, you know. Saxe Woman, Coracancha, and some of these locations are very different from each other. So Peru has so many incredible examples of different types of stone working and understanding of working with stone um all in such a, a a small space and area relatively speaking and to go back a bit to your comment about uh, the stones in saxai Waman being almost of a boring nature um 
I mean, I think it's totally probable, and there are some examples in other locations, specifically in America and in India, where you go to these temples in India, right? Where the there's like the <clears throat> sorry, there's like these deep dark puzzled stones, or if they're not puzzled, please correct me, but they almost look like the original builders, or at least someone drew with their fingers on the stone and left the marks of their fingers on the stone right you can see this in egypt uh, egypt as well in abydos and other places and specifically there's pictures online of a place in america i'm not sure if it's utah or arkansas i'd love i'd have to double check that but it's almost like there's hand prints that go right. yeah so i mean either it was poured or there was some kind of um mineralogical process going on afterwards that kind of uh, modified the vibrational structure of the stone itself and uh, um, well it's almost like the stone itself was hard at a certain point and if you could energize it or magnetize it in some way then you could make these modifications to it where you can draw on them so it's very interesting yeah there's there's you know and I'm sure you guys are aware of this because of what y'all been, uh, you know, getting into and researching is, you know, there's vibrational, there's free, there's vibrational frequencies and different things that you can do that will literally liquefy the ground. And, and, um, you know, there's, there's scientific experiments showing that you can vibrate things at a certain degree and use sound waves to literally turn the ground into liquid and things will sink. Well, now, you can, if people don't understand this, Mike, think about it, and everyone will understand this. If you've got someone from an orchestra that, ah, oh, and it shatters glass. Right. If you play that on a slow frame, when that glass shatters, before it, it actually is soft, and bends and manipulates. So if yeah, you're, kinda. yeah, wobbles, right. exactly. So... It doesn't just shatter. Right. It bends and moves, doesn't it? So it becomes malleable. So the frequency there changes the composition, allows the mineralogy to be used differently, and thus changed. So it may have been different application of technologies that we're seeing. Don't you right. think? Yes. And, you know, I've always thought that how much easier would it be if you were able to pour stone into these massive blocks and shapes how much easier would it be to create Machu Picchu up on the top of these mountains or the pyramids um, in in Egypt how much easier would it be to cart up bags and bags and bags of of the material that you need and then mix it and pour it if that if if you understood that or what whatever the process was was the the only the only issue there is is that is um it, the question that needs to be answered if you're pursuing that line of logic is the areas where we have identified the quarries where these things are coming from and there are specific shapes cut out from those quarries that match up and coincide with certain blocks of stone <laughs> right at the, so at the more at, at the latest examples there are right not at the lower examples right so, so yeah if we if if, if the, these giant geopolymer type polygonal blocks these megalithic you know stones that we're talking about if these are being poured if we're, if we're still staying on the topic of um, of Peru, how much easier would that be to facilitate on top of a mountain or somewhere like in Machu Picchu than coring these massive blocks and then moving them? Sure. Up? For instance, me, Phil, and Guy visit a place in the north of Portugal that is Panoias. And as we were on the site, we started to notice that the, the, the soil itself glitters. Mm. So we are stupid enough not to bring a sample, but we we played with it, we grabbed it, but we were very silly not to grab a, a sample of it because the whole floor was covered in quartz. And next to these quartz, what do we find? This 
uh, megalithic stone boxes with uh, apparent shapes for lids and sometimes there is boxes within the box itself and we speculate couldn't they be to manipulate uh, minerals so you, you they carve the, the crystal they put it into the box they mix it with something and they created a block or a glass or a pure crystal or block of crystal that could be shaped like a diamond afterwards but uh, but i think that regarding the geopolymers i think that the problem with the people that try to follow it is they turn it absolute and they start explaining everything the geopolymer uh, when, right. when, geopolymer when can't be just a geopolymer can it it needs to be told as how the science happened from there exactly and if you're going to actually manipulate a stone to be malleable then you need a certain set of requirements don't you and that would become from frequencies to lyric energies physics the manipulation and amplification of those to and I, it, look we don't understand this nor does anybody they obviously did you've got cart ruts that are completely malleable so what was actually going on it i, I think it, Geopolymer is far too easy a way to describe the science behind. But I think it's valid for some places. I, I think, think it's so valid too. for I, some places. I think it's valid for some places, but then, you know, you have other places where it's completely not valid. Places like Baalbek with the stone of the pregnant woman and the massive blocks that are clearly being cut out. Oh, sure. Where you can see the example of the Trilithon there at, 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 uh, at, the, at Baalbek or places like Aswan Quarry, where they're removing the stone and different places, places like this, where they're clearly, they were, they were cutting out and removing massive, massive megalithic, you know, blocks of stone and transporting them somehow. So, you know, what, what, there isn't a catch all that, 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 that explains everything. I wish there was that make things pretty easy, but uh, you know, it, it also gives us quite a bit more to uh, occupy our time with as far as research, study, and documenting by not having a one answer for all of this. But I think that there's places where these, this idea fits very yeah, well, well, and Peru is one of them. Yeah. The thing is, you see, you see that um, when you find those quarries, and they justified that the stones are not geopolymer because they were quarried and you can see the quarries where the stones are were taken from there's a problem with that and that has already been debunked by academics from other academics and the problem is you have to cut the stone straight either you're going to do geopolymer or not you have to extract the stone the same way you don't have curved uh, uh, saws that that make the curves that the stones are like in, in in the site itself so if you're going to do um if you're going to grind it to make a geopolymer and that's what the academics say for some sites they identify the geopolymer by the the chemical comp compound of the quarry itself where the material was removed then made into powder and then recreated in the sites so there's no difference between the quarry uh, quarried stone and the geopolymer it's up to us to try and find out if what we are seeing is actually a stone that was worked is a stone that was uh like phil and i agree in many places it's it's frequency and, and that sort of technology but perhaps some of these places are also just simple <laughs> geopolymers simple right. just, uh, just a mixture that we don't know how to do it today but but yes, I think that it's a combination of all these factors. And the problem is up to us now, after all these epochs, where first it was to, uh, it was through frequency and, and that sort of technology, then went to try to reproduce that by creating the grounding of the material to create the stones itself. So I think they all appear, but they, they are not the same thing. And that's right. the problem, to find out which is, which is what among all of these uh, samples that we have. And that's what's exciting about Peru is you have all of these different examples. And I think we're seeing this. I, I think we're seeing um, by through these different examples, I think one way to kind of look at some of that is, is it's possibly a way of dating certain things. I think that there is a progression or there is a, through our timeline, there is a, declination of 
of progress and understanding there's a there's a drop off of understanding a continuing drop off and i think we you know i think we do ourselves a real disservice i i know that you guys would probably agree with me on this but i think and and most people no no the science is settled the science is settled but i i think you know i i think you know you guys and most people probably watching this would probably you know agree that we're not on this you know we're we're always told that we're on this like scale of of progression that's continue like we're the most advanced now that, that we've ever been and i i don't i don't necessarily believe that i mean we are so out of touch with natural processes that can be so much easier and long lasting um you know the, you, if we disappeared off the face of the earth in 50 years half of, you know you, you know these cities and different things they'd be gone in 100 200 years they reckon they reckon if it wasn't for the hoover dam in 700 years there'd be no sign of humanity as in us at all right yeah yeah and, and these uh, so who were the pyramids thousands from? of years <laughs> right so it's like you know the uh, I, I, to to dismiss an advanced civilization a worldwide spanning advanced civilization out of hand um is i just think at this point we've we've yeah. it's so ridiculous we've moved so far beyond that um that the academics are the ones playing catch up at this point yeah. the problem is to define what is advanced because if you ask me if using our phones or our computers is advanced technology maybe it is but if you find temples like Long West, um, um, uh, help me, Guy. West Kennet Barrow. West Kennet Long Barrow, sorry. West Kennet Long Barrow, where you have a structure and then you have a smaller structure that is precisely 656 feet away. Okay. So 200 meters away, separated by land, not by building. And when you speak in one of the chambers of the Long West, uh, Long Kennet West Long Barrow, West Kennet Long Barrow, sorry, to the small barrow. If you speak on one of the rooms, the sound will bounce the room, will go through the floor, and will come out 200 meters away in equal volume that was transmitted. Okay, so if this isn't a sign of technology, I don't know what technology is because the thing is, I think we abandoned the technology of using nature about the beginning of the Bronze Age. And from that point on, it was reduced, severely reduced, and then was reborn again with the birth of the religions, the major religions that took over some of that technology. And now it's completely disappearing because not even the churches are are using the the bells that they used to have, and so right. on. let's not go yeah, into that. Yeah, but, but you you forget to mention there, and I'm going to jump in there, guys. Sorry, the Catalan Atlas, where we did a video the other day, Mike. On this is a, a map from 1375, so this isn't when Portugal and Spain had said this is how we're going to ship and map the earth. No, 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 nothing like that. This was an original map that showed on waterways how temples on ley lines were in a specific geometric place. Then you'd get a circular waterway. Then next to it, another set of temples, then a waterway. Then if you didn't have the waterway, mate, and this went all across Africa, I'll show it to you. And it goes all the way across Africa. Then when you get the water again, which is obviously Egypt, it has this trident, like a trident wall. So is it our hallmark walls? Looks like it. So could Saxe, Waman, Olente, Tambo, could all of that been frequency walls that allowed amplification? Could have controlled awe, fear, could have controlled the population, stopped people coming on anywhere near you. I mean, we could be looking at a defensive system here that they mapped perfectly on river systems in 1375 and then we saw inca move into that later on it doesn't mean that we know the ancient world but we're seeing that from 1375 how these technologies were up and down river systems globally now what went on 
before that remains to be seen, but it's definitely there in 1375. Yeah, I think basically everything that we have today, whether you consider it advanced or not, is a corrupted version of what it could be or what it 100%. has been in the past. If you just take your example about sound frequencies and things like that, that you were just talking about, Phil, and you look at the back into, um, you know, what was it, about 100 years ago or almost, when they changed the tuning frequencies, um to uh for music you know there was there was scientific research by the government that showed that the frequency that they were changing it to now and i can't remember the exact frequencies that it the, the tuning frequency used to be this harmonic resonance that was you know uh that was that was good right that had a positive effect on you yeah it gave a feeling of all right and now they really and they, they did yeah that and the government you can look all this up they they had done research and 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 realized that um these frequencies induced panic induced anxiety induced all kinds of negative emotional feelings and the studies and, that they did to go into that to prove it as well and this is around the time that you had you know you, know, you had like crooners and stuff like frank sinatra back in the day you listen to and people would just you know these were superstar celebrities but and then and then they changed the frequencies and you get elvis presley and people losing their freaking minds at concerts and going crazy all of a sudden he's considered the first rock star right well that's right around the time that they changed those frequencies right then and you have women just losing their minds at these concerts and stuff and this has continued on yeah the and the change was only has an effect on people nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the change um, was only three hertz what's that the change was only three hertz they change it for 440 to 443 hertz so you can see what a slight difference can do mm -hmm. in in human behavior and, and really just making that point to show just how technology wise or the example of of, of sound and, and frequencies and vibrations and stuff everything that that we exist with today is like this shadow version of what things used to be like from working with our environment from working with stone and natural things um to everything today having some kind of corrupted version of what it could be sure look our research took us to to try and understand why there were so many Maniers, orthostats in places like in in france you have karnak with all of those and then we start looking at maps and for instance in portugal and in iberia whole iberia portugal and spain 80 percent of the territory at least was covered with those stones mm -hmm. and then we start to realize why would this why why would they take the trouble to put all these orthostats on the fields on the, on the grounds and then I came across a technology that is called electroculture. And they discovered this in the 1900s, the beginning of the 1900s, that if they stick a pole to the ground right. with a small dynamo inside a box and a bifurcate antenna on top, like, like um, lightning, those that are used for lightning strikes. Right. So they'd find out that if they use that, for instance, the tomatoes grow 300% faster, they are more healthy, more tasty, all the seeds germinate with less than 1% of non-germinating seeds. So we start to think, these stones have a amount of content, they have a known electricity, and they connect the below with the above, that's what the antenna right. does, it brings the, the energy of the eater and brings it to the ground. Right. So, along with our research, for, for instance, the cultures of Iberia before 4000 BC, we found that the grounds were so fertile, even the animals were docile, be it them hostile or not, we found out that there was no weapons because the first weapons ever to be recorded happened at the beginning of the Bronze Age, so after some cataclysmic event that changed m most of the, the coasts of, of the uh, Indian Ocean and the Atlantic and the Pacific, so by multiple impacts that started with the Burkle Crater. But the point is, after this system was destroyed, we see a complete loss of technology, be it on agriculture, on husbandry of animals. This energy, they change from the, the, the planets 
the plains, they change from the plains into hilltops and try to fortify their fields because they have to, to keep what they have. Invasions came from the north. 98% uh, of the males were killed. So our genes in Portugal and Iberia are complete mess because the, those that lived here were 96% killed, the male. Only the female remain on this area because they finally managed to invade this area, which they couldn't. So I think, yes, it, com according to what you're saying, our technology might be advanced, but theirs was also advanced. That's, that's my point. <laughs> and more natural, which I prefer. Yeah, and I think it's completely, you know, I, I've long traveling around the world as much as I have and, and seeing everything, I think that there was access to free energy and it, it, you know, straight out of the, as you just mentioned, the ether out of the sky, you know, like magnetism that, you know, if, if you exist in a culture and a society that has access to free energy, people would want for nothing. I mean, you, you know, and I think that's where you get a level of creativity when you're unencumbered by, you know, the the daily grind for um, things like energy to, uh, you know, to, to provide for yourself, you're not stuck under some kind of monetary system or different things like that. If you have access to free energy, I think everybody would be, you'd live in a culture and a type of society where everybody is pursuing their passions, right? You, imagine a life, an entire life, devoted to pursuing your 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 passions you'd have experts in every field i mean you know you that would be capable of incredible things um you know it's 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 a such a small percentage of our population who do things you know to to such a, a finite degree of of uh expertise and whatever field they are that are able to make it where that's all that they do that their entire life is focused on that you know 99 percent of people spend the, the majority of all their time working and then trying to squeeze in whatever their passion is you know if you lived in some kind of society where energy was free you had access to free energy you how many michelangelo's or or whoever would we have in this world we'd be full of them but they were spotted at childhood for their talents and now sure. we would destroy the talents of children by teaching everyone the same and <laughs> teach them to right. memorize, not to learn, right. to memorize, not to question, to memorize. Right. So everyone is equal. That's how we kill all our artists. That's how we mm -hmm. kill our intellectuals, our philosophers, our historians. They are all killed in the early years of school because it's scientific. What you tell the children between the age of six and the age of 14 it keeps with the child forever either she remembers it or not it, it stays there so it, it's something that we have in our brains that make us capture everything in the learning process so everything that is given to them that's why it's the the pressure is so big during those ages yeah. so we we kill our artists we that's what what the system does and they first find it to such a level that i think anybody that who's made any kind of attempt at forging their own path in life truly understands what we're talking about here because it is an absolute grind to forge your own path and pursue your own interests and try to make a living doing something that you're passionate about and that you love you really have to uh you really have to have a a, a level of of don't quit to you to be able to to to, to do that because First of all, you have to break out and break free of, of this, this mode of thinking that you just described, Ricardo, that's been instilled in you since, you know, your first day in school in any kind of public, public education system is learning to think for yourself. And then, you know, you have to kind of forge your own path out of these lanes that have, that have just been, you know, that are so easy to fall into of just, you know, work pay bills go to sleep work pay bills go to sleep work pay you know it's so hard to get out of that because you still in the society have to pay bills so it's like you finding a way to make it is is a real challenge and a grind but you know um i think that's one of the biggest things that i love about this community is everybody's so supportive of others who are actually doing that is 
um, and, and people that are that are making that effort is that other people are cheering them on, cheering, you know, um, cheering you on. And, and, and some of the people that I've looked up to the most when I've had the absolute pleasure of meeting them have been so encouraging and helpful in this space. And um, uh, that's such a such a great thing to be a part of. It's also like very sad that most jobs are actually fake at, until in at least in my opinion because most of them don't bring any real value that can be like uh actually measured it's all just like these slots where we have to fit in right one after the other we have to fit in these little uh slots and um it's mm -hmm. all to the benefit of the greater monolith of the system itself and uh, if we all took a pause and if we all took a moment of reflection, we would understand that uh, if we follow the natural order at that uh, old cultures did, if we go back to the shamanic roots, if we go back to kind of a decentralized way of, uh, of, of culture, then we can uh, we could actually build so much more. So it's uh, a shame that uh, the current state of events, but yeah, we strive and we... I, I will say something positive on that is that there it it seems like there is so much negativity going on in the world but the, the thing that I think that's important to realize and recognize is what you're talking about is is there's a lot there there's a whole so many people are starting to wake up and do these things and behave this way right and I think what we're seeing all this negativity that's going on in the world it just feels like there's just more and more and more and more of it and bad things happening and all this different stuff there's always something going wrong is it's just it's that grip of trying to like tighten up on 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 this it's a response to what's happening to people it's waking the fear up and taking it's the fear control factor. over their own lives yeah so you know it's you know more rules more regulations more limitations all these things are, are are kind of a response to people waking up it's that 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 fist of control trying to keep control um as more and more people are kind of waking up questioning and breaking out of the, that mold that you just described yeah it's to ground people actually ground them to forget that what they are that the divine part of humans they are half divine if either by science or either by religion if we look into it we are half divine because we are a miracle in science and we are sons of gods in 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 um, in religion so we are half divine either way so the thing is they are grounding us so that we forget our real self those that live perhaps in the in the um geomorphic field around us or the guy that is behind the, the 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 joystick on the other dimension having the experience here whatever people want to believe yeah the fact is the brain is just an interface but it has a, a small amount of consciousness that can and we see 99.9 percent of the people living through it through those five percent of consciousness that is a residual consciousness that allows you if in case you lost contact or you decide not to live for your spirit that you'll be able to live in this world and th that fear factor war famine war killing war disaster right. uh, um, so all this is the old fear factor that was used through frequencies now can be done not only by frequencies in some places but also by this constant feed of information that everything is terrible, the world is always in uproar, and you have your own problems. And then suddenly, let's move on to football. Yeah, it's psychological warfare. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 100%. And then, and then, every single time that you go anywhere and meet someone from somewhere new, it's nothing like what you've been seeing at all. I've had the honor from being a young serviceman up to present day where I travel three or four times a year, not quite as much as my car hero does. Uh, but I'm really lucky with travel as well. And I'm also humbled. If you you show humility yeah. where you go, everybody shows humility to you. And you have such a wonderful time everywhere and yeah. i've had i can't tell you anywhere i haven't had a wonderful time so yeah 
I, I have to agree with that is none of the places that I've traveled to have been anywhere near like what they've been described as um, or what you would think they are like from if you get your information from the news. So I, you know, you know, fear is not a state that I um, choose to live in. And when I'm being fed information, um, you know, and f- you know, I can tell that fear is the desired response. Um, I immediately know that that's garbage. I use I use discernment to um, to 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 work work through that. It, you know, fear is a manipulation tactic, and keeping us in a state of fear doesn't allow you to access these these parts of your life. Uh, um, you know, to live with gratitude and thankfulness and, and be humble. Um, uh, it keeps you in a scarcity mindset um, and, a, and, and a mindset of protect what you have. Um, don't, ven- don't venture out. Don't chance. Don't risk. You, you don't, you know, there's danger over here, but there's not. It's, it's, it's just, yeah, you know, fear is not a good, good place to exist in it's constant suspicion we are all suspicious of everyone else yeah and and here's here's the truth the average person it doesn't matter where you go we're all the same everybody is basically looking to provide for themselves and their family to be happy and to be safe and and fed and taken care of have have their basic needs met have a community around them with their family and friends and and it's it's basically the same everywhere you go that's what everybody is trying to do um and you know so if you exist in a space of of um fearfulness you know traveling around the world i mean you're not going to step out you know you're not going to see that in other people but when 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 you recognize that about everybody you understand that when you're traveling in different places and experiencing different cultures or different things then we're basically all after the same thing you know the average person the 99 percent of us you know not not the sociopathic people that are like consistently striving for power over other people obviously but um it's a big beautiful wonderful world out there and um i'm grateful every day that i get to wake up and, and experience it um and i didn't used to feel that way um you know you know you know yeah. what tom white says right there is no devil. It's just God when he's drunk. <laughs> when he's drunk. <laughs> I, I, I would like to cut in here, guys, and say at this point uh, that Mike, and we did touch on it earlier, is doing a tour in Peru with our very own Nikki Arna Jones. And you, you guys go and check out Mike's site. I'm going away in July to july 22nd to august the first to do sintra with um ricardo and Guy. we would love you to come with us mike or at least come and have a go and see if we can meet up at that point in time then when we get back from there you're in scotland and i of course live in great britain so i think at that point you and i should definitely be meeting in scotland yeah yeah and, if not if not sooner on the other trip i would love to do that in august i'll be on um doing i, I joined um uh i'll be um doing uh hugh the awesome hugh newman's uh trip through wow. scotland so yeah. i jumped on his uh tour and got my ticket for that and uh by the way huge shout out to hugh because his website has an incredible um resource there with his interactive map on his website that's helped me out hugely identifying places here in malta specifically um and he he uh if you guys aren't familiar with him it's megalithomania um, oh i've done an interview just recently with yeah. super voyager himself <laughs> he's i've been a, on he's a awesome. podcast so yeah, yeah i and, i'm really au okay with all of them brilliant uh, people hugh hugh used to be one of my heroes when i he's awesome grew up. And, and you know what to some degree he still is so uh, uh i'm i'm really pleased i said on the podcast uh how come i haven't been invited to come there. Now I'm gonna come. 
I just put myself on all of you anyway. And I know that they won't care. So it is what it is. So yeah, it's great to uh to uh to, well for you to come to Scotland and do some testing at West Kennet Barrow. And then for yeah. us, that would be huge if you're up for it. I, would, I, I think it sounds amazing. I would love to do that. And um, yeah, thank you for shouting out the trip. I'm really looking forward to that in uh, uh, October with Nikki um, from Nikki Anna Jones. Um, and uh, I set the price really low for this Peru trip. So if you've ever wanted to go to Peru, it's easy to jump on that trip. And, you and how, can how can in. people find it? How can people find it? Uh, you can go to my website, wanderingwolfproductions.com. Um, it's also linked in my videos. And we'll link it in the video where we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's it's going to be a great trip. You can lock it in with a small down payment and then pay it off until the trip. And so there's a lot can of different Can you do options. that, Mike? Can you do that? Because I, yeah. I, I, I've wanted to come on that since you released it. I would oh, love yeah, that. I, yeah. I really do want to call that. We go into Serpent Mound like at the end of October. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it could be a crazy year if we all get it going right. Like, and lots That's a of lot travel. of travel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what's fun, right? And 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 uh, yeah, uh, uh, Peru. And everyone just out. disconnected from the video because they are so envious. They just disconnected for all that <laughs> happiness, <laughs> and they are sitting at home. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, this could be a great. I think twenty twenty four is going to uh, be everyone is invited. Year. Everyone. Yes. yes I, 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 I mean, I the mean off, off the record, and we can use it if needs be. But like. <laughs> What exciting times for on boots on ground research is that we're all getting our shit together and really we can go and meet and let's go and look at what it. we've researched and go and kill it. I mean, the papers that we could write off the back of what we all know with our own eyes, no and shaking hands and being humble and let's go to work. And we would yeah. all be amazing on site together, guys. I this is what it's all agree. about. It it's so much fun scenes. hitting sites with with yeah. with other ancient history nerds, so to speak. Right? <laughs> yeah. They can just geek out over all this stuff. I mean, when we get, you know, when you get together, the the only problem here's the only problem with traveling with with a bunch of other people who are as into ancient history and stuff sites like this as you are, is that you'll have plans for hitting a specific number of sites and doing things, and you never do it because you end up stuck at some place for five hours when you should have only been there for you know you know because it oh. takes you 30 minutes to walk 10 feet right so. mike mike that'd be me at one block going guys i'm touching yeah. a nub. Yeah. come and give me a cuddle i'm a, come 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 i'm touching a nub. i'm here I'm he's, he's been yeah. with me before he's been a britia rush with me before we've been terrible together <laughs> I agree. Yeah. And there's something to be said for get going out and doing some of the stuff, you know, in person, it, it changes you, um, you know, being at some of these places, uh, yourself and in person. And the cool thing is, is I, I feel like the world's getting so much smaller with some of the things that we have access to now that it's possible for everybody even in america there's so many people that send me stuff all the time of just from that they hadn't thought of i've been hiking this trail for 20 years and i was watching your videos and i started thinking i should take pictures of some of this stuff it's like yeah send it to me yeah. you know it's not everything that i agree with but i think it's important the process it's like you were saying before earlier about the journey the journey is the it's not the end goal it's the journey when you get to a point where you're grateful and appreciative of the journey that you're on what a place to be that's so much better than you know because you wake up every day feeling like you have a purpose and, and a goal and happy and grateful for what you're doing yeah. instead of yeah. just trying to get to an objective or a point percent. a wise you know, man once said that if you like what you do you'll not work one day on your yeah, life yeah, yeah so yeah i had someone ask me um very similar to that I had someone ask me once. Um, they said, "Well, how, how, what do you, how, how are you planning to retire doing what you're doing with this decision?" This was closer to when I decided to make. And I said, 
I don't plan on retiring. I don't want to retire. I want to work doing something I love till the day that I, till I can't do it anymore. I want to do this thing that I love doing. I found something. It took me 40 years to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And um, I want to do that as long as I can. I don't want to retire, you know? Yeah. Um, Absolutely. I don't, I don't want to quit. You know, I don't know. I don't want to wake up. I want, I've, I've watched several family members retire and spend every day for the next 15, 20 years, however long they had sitting on a couch, watching TV from the time they woke up till they went to sleep and then died. And yeah, there's a lack of the, gold. There's that's a not lack. the life I want. We have yeah. three days a week constantly talking all three of us of how to move this forward got the institute sorted got the sos sorted got a library sorted we took people's skill sets from years of team i mean gee's been with me three or four years before you came into the team and from an 18 year old boy he's now a master's degree and he's got a server runs everything to do with the institute the guy's a living legend you know how he is but where and we've traveled for a couple of years now where we've done multiple sites on the hallmarks we've become like spearheaded like you said earlier on to if we go on to a site mate the three of us have go bang 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 hallmark 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 here 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 hallmark here 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 like we would do with you you know what yeah. it'd be like it would be a spear right ahead of mike we're setting up here now we're all gonna go bang and we'd just come back with data 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 drone data 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 and i think when you could get that team correct on site we will all become so lethal at what we're doing because we're not only taking ground up frequencies to how they amplify out the hallmarks to exactly what the site does from above the site to we'll have everything on lockdown to every single site that we choose to go to and i think that is such a progression for this team i can't wait to have that in place can you i think it'll be amazing yeah it's when i think even more so is when you find your group or or people that say yes and show up that is such a uh uh and they show up consistently that that's such a blessing right when and, and if you're a part of a team where everybody's showing up and doesn't quit even when things get hard sometimes things get hard and don't go the way that you want them to go and you the, the all you have to do is not quit that's it for any of this and anybody out there that's like yeah. listening and 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 wondering you know how they can, might be able to like make a change in their life to do something you just have to do you just have to do as much as you can do or just a little bit even if it's just a little bit at a time it's it's that thing just every day tiny Mike. And every don't quit. single day can you be a little bit better than you was a little yesterday? bit yeah that's all that's, that's it. all just a little bit because it's not so it's it's really exciting when big steps happen and big things happen it's really exciting right but but the it the little steps are the ones that get you there to the to the to the finish line so if you're doing little steps every day and you just don't quit you'll get there and if you're surrounded by um other people that have the same mentality as you that are working towards and you can share the same vision and goal and all go in the same direction what a blessing what an absolute blessing to be a part of something like that it's the little wow. things frodo it's the little things that i yeah. found out that keep evil at bay that's it small lights of small acts of kindness it really is and because little decisions and little steps they build so whether you're making whether you make little decisions for things that are progressing you positively in a certain direction or whether you're they're they're little concessions that you make throughout your day towards stuff that you shouldn't be doing 
either way is going to take you to it in a specific direction. So it's just doing those little things. Just, you know, are you coming home? You're working a job. You have this idea for something that you want to do with your life. Are you coming home? And yes, you're tired. You worked all day and it sucked. Is there one little thing that you could do that day to, to progress you forward? Whether it's 15 minutes or 30 minutes, is there 30 minutes that you can give to this thing? Well, if you do that every day, that 30 minutes turns into a, a big thing. But if you put it down and, and, and you concede to, 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 to whatever else, you know, whether it's, you know, that 30 minutes, you're like, no, I'm just too tired today. I'm going to play video games or I'm going to do this or that. Well, you're, you're, you're going to move towards that direction long term on that path. So just do little things, lots of lots of lots of little things. And eventually you start, you look back. I look back five, six years, and I can't believe where I'm at right now from where I was six, seven years ago, actually now. I must be doing something right. Go on. I must be doing something right. Everyone tells me to work less. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, uh, I guess it makes sense from a metaphysical perspective as well, because if you see all possible future timelines ahead of you, you just have to nudge yourself into the right one, right? To to kind of try to navigate it, right? So, yeah, just two small steps every day. And I've been learning a lot with that, actually. I've been uh, through some dark, dark times and realized that just... uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's it's not good to be like over criticize uh, to, to not over criticize yourself to not beat yourself over the 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 defeats but also to that do uh, you need to celebrate the, the the achievements right and that you need to just every day try a little harder just every day um, try to find a focus and the the will to carry on and yeah absolutely. Like becoming good at stuff, you know, and also just to build on that, you know, the you the but becoming good at something is a byproduct of doing these little steps. The little steps are what take you there, and along the way, you gain experience. And just be okay with sucking at whatever it is that you want to do if you're just starting. Just be okay with that because excellence is a byproduct of doing the work. You will be you will become excellent at what you're doing you'll become good at it and eventually you'll start being proud of the things that you're creating when i look back at my first videos that i put on the channel which you can still find they're so embarrassing but i leave them up even though, even though they're so you know i'm doing intros to videos like hi my name is mike and i'm today on the show we're doing and it's like it's just so crazy. Oh, those your, were your best. Those were your best. <laughs> they were my best at the time. And I sounded like just that, uh, uh, ancient architects. Hello, this is Phil from <laughs> Ancient Alternative. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the ancient, the place where everyone's a vision virus. But you get better. How else are you supposed to learn? <laughs> That's how you can learn. And when you make these little decisions practice, every practice, day. Practice. Yeah, excellence is a byproduct of of doing the work. So you'll get there. It's just time. A lot of people are not willing to put the time in or wait. It takes time. It's just that's just what it is. It takes time. I mean, not for everybody. Somebody, some people put out like three videos and get a million subscribers, but that's not the case for most people, right? Like, yeah, yeah, not my case. I think sure. as well, um, Mike. It, again, I'll reiterate on this. It's content for me. It's content. I've done videos for years and whatever. It's content. It's not. Hello, look at me. Look at what I'm doing. It's what's in the video. What are you doing within it? And not not you, but the person themselves, right. you know. Um, look, we can all have Jimmy as a friend. We can all get called out as big channels. That's fine. But you work for your big call out and you work for your, yeah. your, for your channels and what you do. And that's fine you you that that's not what any of us have said here what what it is is a network of people that are all looking at doing the same thing that would be humble enough 
to work together. And I mentioned Jimmy, yourself, Nikki, everybody, all would be. These people are all humble enough to know their strengths and weaknesses, as you guys out there will, yeah. as we do too here. We're none of us experts in every field, which is why we want to take teams of exceptional people within their fields to these places you know, and it might be that, you know, I'm a hallmark expert and you're an ancient site expert and but geologists and archaeologists and frequency experts, everybody, maths, science, everybody's got their place within this field to make the ancient world come back to life. Yeah. It's as simple as that. And that's what we're looking for is a combined skill set. So have you got that? Have you got that? And then we take everybody together and hit that site at once. That's what I want to be able to do, Mike. Right, here's 10 of us. doesn't matter who they are, whether on your channel, my channel. Right, we're looking for this. Watch your CV. Boom, here we go. Right, 12 of us. There you go. Bang, 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 bang. Goes live. And there you go. That's what I'd like to be able to do, Mike. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I think don't be afraid if you're, if you have something that you, you want to share and participate with people and don't be afraid to reach out and ask. Yeah. Start doing your own thing so you have your own body of work. Um, yeah. yeah. Independent of, of people, you know. Um, yeah. Have an idea and pursue it. Hence yeah. the institute. Exactly. Hence the institute. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Look, if, even for papers, we have about 90 slots available for everyone that wants to write a paper that we can publish. Go ahead. So far, only us have written, but we're still expecting for people to come forward and share their, their, their interests, their ideas, and put it, put it actually to where someone can analyze them, can look at them instead of being on ahead or putting a few comments on X. So let's put it out there fully. Let's see what it has. Let's so, learn from it. Yeah. So what we'd actually like to do, as we've been general chatting for a little bit, is I'm going to figure in just a small ending to everything, just so we've got one mic, all right? Okay. Yeah. Wow. So this evening, it's been an absolute pleasure, Mike, to have had you with us. Mike's travels with Ad G, Nibiru, and Ricardo this evening. Speaking of his travels within Malta, we look forward and hope to catch up with Mike on his travels all over Europe. Will we see him in Portugal? Is he going to be with me in Scotland? He's a little bit of a like, where's Waldo? Of where is he going <laughs> to turn up with all the teams? So we're really honoured to have had him with us this evening. Ricardo. Guy, I'm sure you guys have got big thank yous to make to uh, the main man himself, but on my own behalf, thank you, Mike, for having us, mate. Thank you guys so much. Uh, absolute pleasure to connect. Uh, we've been friends for quite some time and, and trade stuff back and forth online. Uh, but this was an absolute pleasure and a treat to sit down with you guys. Uh, it's it's always uh, fun to dig into sure. all these it was topics an honor. And stuff, you know. Thank you, Mike. It was a, it was a real honor. honor to, to speak for me as well. Yeah, it really is, mate, to get to speak to you live online and uh, to to hear about where you actually are in the world. Because, like I say, it is a bit of a where's world of where I, to find you. And, yeah, uh, I found this Airbnb that's like kind of. It was like it's like down in the in the in the ground so i'm i'm actually below ground outside and there's i mean valletta and outside is like the the water and the bay and everything which is really oh, neat wow. That's no, cool we are already drooling we're drooling right now <laughs> <laughs> but i'm in this little cave type of place here. It looks that, amazing. It's, that a, it's that the fireplace or the bed over here is the is a, like a cubby hole for the bed okay so, yeah. so it's, it's not small it's actually decent. five star living for like yeah. a wandering wolf this is how <laughs> this is how you live in the ancient world guys this is how you uh, you he, he remove all the servants from the house that were bringing him champagne yeah, yeah, before. Yeah. <laughs> 
Not quite. We're getting there. <laughs> hopefully, 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 we'll get there. But uh, yeah, it's it's yeah, it, it's 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 only it in really the capstone cool. of the Giza. Only on the capstone of the Great Pyramid. There, I want a glass of champagne seated on top of there. There, there, I would take it. That would be something. <laughs> Just a little bit of a special, guys, if we can hopefully force with his arm behind his back mike to get back to the Tarxian temples for a couple of hours on his final day we may be able to get a little bit of experimentation <laughs> if we're really lucky let's and, see, uh, let's see. if that if that is very possible then we'll bring out another video very soon where we can bring you some results from uh, absolutely, absolutely one of our temples but We'll see about that, guys. So I'll send you the email with that. Yeah. Perfect. Gee? Perfect. Gee? Did we lost Guy? Is he? Uh, I'm here. Oh, there you are. You want to say um, a few last words? Yeah, just uh, want to thank Mike for your time and uh, yeah, um, very excited for the the future of the institute and uh, the creative ways that we can collaborate together and. Uh, yeah, just looking forward to all the research and all the um, uh, future possibilities we, we can have here. So, yeah, definitely stay tuned for next episodes, maybe. And, uh, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm really looking forward to, to hopefully meeting you guys in person. That'll be great. Tintra is a true magical place. And when I mean true magical, I mean true magical is when a place of power was transformed into a place of magic so it's not a natural energy is improved uh, i mean and if you look at, if you look at date 27th of july will be there for four days if you're anywhere near or could possibly be anywhere near sintra or lisbon and we'll come and grab you yeah absolutely a few days. <laughs> absolutely uh if not i'm definitely coming and seeing you in august in scotland that's gotta be a must before yeah. you serpent mound that's uh, too, yeah, too easy and uh then we've got the serpent mound going too would you yeah. be open to doing some testing with me at West Kennet for the weekend? Oh, absolutely. I think we definitely have to connect on that because, uh, yeah, that'll be fun. I'd need to, we'd need to have a few conversations, see what equipment we could get and who we could get to do stuff. But even if it's me and you, me and you will do it and I'll bring my computer and speakers and we'll do what we've got to do. Do you know what I mean? I, I think it sounds exciting and. Hey so easily doable for us to connect while i'm over there yeah brilliant yeah yeah oh. i'll come and see you no problem whatsoever we can we can get it's not airbnbs here they're just hotels but b and b's <laughs> you can get them so we'll be all good mate we'll be all good Perfect. and and with that bombshell thank you everyone for being with us it was a wonderful time thank you for being with us wandering wolf Mike, anytime it was anytime. a big big pleasure thank you for that absolutely guys thank you very for fun farewell to for everyone thank you thank you guys all the very best Bye. see you again soon bye bye